Well, greetings everyone and welcome to our next lecture together on the crime of aggression. Um, let me start again by going through some of the objectives of what I hoped we would address today. They are as follows. I want you to emerge from the class with an understanding of the scope of the crime of aggression. Aggression essentially means uh, waging an illegal war, and we'll talk about what the parameters of that mean. It's important that you emerge with that understanding. I also want you to have an understanding of the historical controversies about this offense, including its origins, where exactly did this come from, uh, which picks up on our class on retroactive criminal law. Uh, I want again to discuss the effects of this crime, and by that I mean well, what's the what are the political implications of enforcing this? And then finally, um, how has this been applied in practice, and does this give rise, give rise to concerns uh, that we looked at about unequal enforcement, and if so, what do we make of that? I also want you to develop an idea about how aggression relates to the UN Charter on the one hand and to the ideals of international criminal law on the other. And what I hope to show you is that uh, our understanding of aggression sits between these two poles. On the one hand, a pole that's highly deferential to the way the UN Charter deals with use of force issues, and on the other, um, a set of ideas about equality before the law, about impartiality in international criminal law that create an important tension between, um, between themselves that constructs how we should understand aggression. Fourth, I want to promote an understanding of the limitations of the definition of the crime of aggression as recently added to the ICC statute, and so we'll go through again um, the ICC statute and the elements of the offense so that you emerge with an understanding of how the iteration that was just added to the ICC statute in 2010 uh, fits within the two poles that I described in three. And throughout this, and I, I know this is repetitive, but throughout I'm really trying to generate a, an understanding of the connections between a, a aggression and other classes in this course about critique of international law, about the history of international law, uh, about other ideas of retroactive criminal law, our understanding that emerged from discussing other crimes. Uh, hopefully this sort of process of triangulation now will be quite rich for you and you can draw lots of connections and parallels that are illuminating. So let's start with this short introduction to crimes against peace. Crimes against peace is a synonym for aggression. It's the way that the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals described uh, aggression. And I wanted to start, I guess, by talking about this and providing you with a short introduction, just so you understand exactly what it is that we're talking about as we move through the controversies and then to the sort of the scope of the iteration in the Rome Statute now. And to begin with, I wanted to highlight this idea from the Nuremberg judgment to really bring home to you the central importance of aggression as conceived in Nuremberg. Because as you see from the quote, aggression is understood at the time as the essence of why we have international criminal law institutions. It is the supreme international crime. And as you see from the quote, it's conceived as the supreme crime because it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. And let me explain what I think that means. And let me unpack that briefly. So if you focus on crimes against humanity, The, the protected group are members of the civilian population. Likewise, war crimes are a limited set of violations that doesn't really cover the widespread killing of soldiers, which is part and parcel of the ways war pan out. 
but the argument with aggression is that by launching an illegal war, by being aggressive and going to war in the first place, all of the war crimes and the crimes against humanity and the genocide, and importantly, the, the loss of lives of so many soldiers, which wouldn't necessarily be covered by any of those other um, international crimes, all of those things are subsumed within the greater evil, which was going to war in the first place. And so if we are to build a hierarchy of international crimes, and you'll remember our previous class where we talked about the significance and, and inescapable uh, but very difficult process of doing that, then, argues Nuremberg, aggression is the most important. Every other evil flows from it. What a provocative idea. In a way, as we'll see in just a moment, that idea is somewhat historically ironic, given that after Nuremberg, there was a spectacular decline of aggression in the rise of modern international criminal justice. And so while it was conceived of as the supreme international crime, it would soon be replaced by ideas about genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes, and more or less disappear. We'll come more, say more about that in just a moment. I also wanted to start in this short introduction to Crimes Against Peace by highlighting the challenge of definition. And the challenge of definition is one that will plague this crime and in part, in large part, is the reality that leads to its disappearance over the intervening years between the end of the Second World War and 2010, when it, a new iteration that we'll look at in just a moment was adopted by states parties to the International Criminal Court. And so if this idea about the difficulty of defining aggression is a recurrent stumbling block for the crime, I wanted to start by showing you how this played out at Nuremberg and at Tokyo, so you get a sense from the very departure just how tricky this is. So this, uh, in the PowerPoint now, which I can read to you, um, is a definition of crimes against peace, aka aggression, that was adopted uh, in the London Charter for the Nuremberg Tribunals and then subsequently also for the Tokyo Tribunal. Uh, and this is the definition. Crimes against peace, namely planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression, or a war in violation of international treaties, agreements, or assurances, or participation in a common plan or conspiracy for the accomplishment of any of the foregoing. Now, that doesn't tell you terribly much, and there's a whole wide range of issues about the legality of use of force, from cyber attack to humanitarian intervention that this says nothing about. And one of the major critiques of this definition is that it's circular. Because if crimes against human excuse me, if crimes against peace is a synonym for aggression, which is the way it's always been understood, then effectively this definition says aggression, namely planning, preparation, initiation, or waging a war of aggression. So that circularity means the parameters of the offense ver are very much up in the open. And maybe it's so vague as to be a punt, a, a sort of a pass to judges to define aggression however they like in the political context, which is one of the factors that gives rise to a criticism of Victor's justice. As we will see vagueness of the crime of aggression is a problem that resurfaces time and again and that has plagued the crime all the way to present day. So with that short introduction I hope I've whet your appetite so to speak about some of the core problems that will emerge with aggression. 
on the one hand it's viewed as the supreme international crime and yet it dies out after the Second World War in part because it's vague, it's defined in a way it's, that's circular, and once we come to concretize precisely what it means, we reach some degree of political impasse because we just can't agree about the circumstances under which it should be criminal to go to war. So that at least, at least provides a framework from which uh, I want to discuss now a set of four historical controversies with aggression. The first picks up on our class on retroactive criminal law. And the first controversy, which in a way we have discussed, is, well, where does this crime come from exactly? And as we discussed previously, there had been an important process of outlawing war embodied in the kellogg briand Pact of 1928. But like the provisions of the Hague Regulations of 1907 which governed conduct during war, just in bello, the prohibition of jus contra bellum, the idea that you can't go to war, that war itself has been made illegal, also contained no references to criminal responsibility. To reiterate, the pact was a treaty. It was a, an agreement that was signed between states, and up until that moment, all international law was about state-to-state -state obligations. It's as if uh, I make a contract, or well, my university makes a contract with a corporation downtown and says these are the these are the parameters of our agreement together. It's contractual, and these two entities are entering into, enter into, entering into these contractual agreements. And then someone after the fact says, oh, and, uh, you know, although you guys entered into that contract between two sort of corporate entities, violations of the terms of that contract give rise to individual criminal responsibility by those within those entities who violated the principles, whoa, that's a very big leap in thinking. Uh, no one really contemplated that at the time. So the first controversy, and it's a significant controversy that you'll see arise time and again, including in the reading for today, which suggests, well, well, aggression has this major problem that it risks being retroactive criminalization. And what's interesting about that argument, to pick up on our previous class also, is that if something is defined in exceedingly vague ways, that also gives rise to the same sorts of concerns as retroactive criminal legislation, because without strict parameters, the danger becomes that conduct that wasn't explicitly prohibited is subject to criminal sanction after the fact. And there is again in that process an undermining of freedom and liberal principles. So the first controversy is that, bah, you know, at Nuremberg, they kind of invented this. And they erected an entire scaffolding of criminal law around a public international law treaty in ways that was totally unprecedented. So the question, where does this crime aggression come from, is an important initial historical controversy with the offense. The second is a, that I want to raise with you is about the substance of aggression. Is it really fair to have a prohibition, a criminal offense that prohibits going to war? And in this context, there's a very famous dissenting opinion from an Indian judge called Justice Powell that I recommend to your reading uh, at the Tokyo Tribunal, who is substantively critical of the idea of aggression. Because in his mind, it freezes the, the distribution of power throughout the world presently, without acknowledging that that distribution of power came about by illegal warfare. And so he is concerned about locking in the status quo, regardless of 
the illegitimacy, regardless of the injustice that's manifest in the status quo, that's brought, brought about by force. And so he has a very eloquent, eloquent passage within his dissenting opinion, where he talks about dominated nations of the present day status quo cannot be made to submit to eternal domination only in the name of peace. The idea here is, well, there are bigger questions about injustice at stake here, and criminalizing aggression risks locking them in. One of the major questions, of course, at the time, and still now in different guise, is colonialism. And we see, in a way, the application of aggression in ways that defer to colonialism and speak to the sorts of victor's justice, one-sidedness that we uh, saw in other lectures. And so I want to give you one example of this one-sidedness and, and one example of this deference to uh, power that has permeated the application of aggression. It's an example that I draw from my article with Asad Kiani uh, called the Ahistoricism of Legal Pluralism and International Criminal Justice that I assigned for a previous lecture. So you can look up more about this if it interests you. But the example stems from a uh, an application of aggression in the Tokyo Tribunal after the Second World War, which was largely focused on aggression and aggression alone. And it relates to an agreement that the Japanese government entered into with the French government in 1940, such that the Japanese could bring a military presence into what the Tokyo Tribunal describes as, quote, French Indochina, end quote. And so the tribunal goes through the process of reasoning whether the Japanese military invasion of French Indochina constitutes aggression by starting with a reference that I have here in the PowerPoint to, to a recognition of, quote, the sovereignty of France in all parts of the Union of Indochina, end quote. And then the court goes on to address the defense arguments. Well, actually, the, the Japanese troops were in French Indochina uh, on the basis of the Matsuoko Henry Agreement. So they effectively, the French effectively consented to this. And the Tokyo Tribunal says, well, actually, no, they really only agreed to that under duress and... Um, it was sort of like gunboat diplomacy. If they hadn't agreed to, they would have been invaded anyway. And so you can't really say that's consent. Consent's vitiated by coercion. And therefore, this does constitute aggression on the part of the Japanese, for which individuals who are being tried uh, can be held responsible. But if you're concerned about the idea of victor's justice, about political instrumentalization that I referred to at the very beginning, then you must be concerned about the absence of any recognition that the ways in which European powers claim title to three quarters of the world, including French Indochina, was a brought about by identical legal processes. And so there were various ways in which this parallel emerged during Second World War trials, one of which uh, that I also uh, cite in the piece I mentioned is the cross-examination of Hermann Goering about the concept of Lebensraum, which Lebensraum means uh, living space, which was sort of a, a rhetorical justification for Nazi expans expansionism throughout Europe. And when quizzed about it in the context of allegations of aggression, Goering replied snidely, I understand that the allied powers who claim title to three quarters of the world understand the concept differently. So there's a, there's a sort of an elephant in the room about aggression, and that is, well, it's substantively unfair in that it locks in the distribution of power that was brought about by violence. It's 
enforced in ways that are highly politically instrumentalized and deferential to one side. And ultimately, it risks uh, staining the project of international criminal justice, especially the aspects that promise equality of application, that attempt to align international criminal justice with rule of law, uh, that speak, to, speak in the name of justice more generally. The fourth controversy is one that I wanted to pick up on. I gestured at it within our short introduction just a moment ago. And that is, why did it disappear? There were literally no prosecutions after the Second World War up until now. None? But there was this spectacular rise of international criminal justice after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall in the 1990s. Um, it, it really was what Catherine Sikink called the justice cascade. And it sort of cascaded in all sorts of different ways, shapes, and forms. There were the ad hoc tribunals initially, and then there were hybrid tribunals, and then there were all these national cases in national courts and tribunals. Um, thousands of lawyers moved into the field and um, universities populated with academics who purported to uh, have expertise on one or more of the constitutive elements and yet no prosecutions for aggression. What explains this? Wasn't it the crime of crimes? Wasn't it the supreme of all international crimes that contains within it the amalgamated evil of all other international crimes? How is it that this came about? And Samuel Moyne has an interesting uh, piece that talks about the disappearance of aggression and the rise of <clears throat> atrocitization, which is a word he coins, I think, <clears throat> to explain how our fixation on atrocities like genocide and crimes against humanity and war crimes replaced aggression as the most important focus after World War II. And that pacifism in a way, the sort of pacifism that had animated aggression, uh, disappeared in ways that allowed for greater use of force in the world. So part of the part of the argument is that, well, potentially modern international criminal justice in this regressive form is facilitative of war because of its silence on that score. Well, before we get to the new definition of aggression that is codified in 2010 in Kampala and added to the ICC statute as a result of that political process, at least for some states, we'll look at that momentarily. I did want to talk to you about two poles, two conceptual poles that aggression is stuck between because uh, of the way this that it interfaces with the global political order that we have presently. So that brings us to this first question. Why have there been such difficulties defining the prohibition on the use of force in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter? And that question really is important for you to understand. And you can, just by reading some of the materials for today, you start to get a sense of how difficult it, it was. There was this initial process at Nuremberg, but even the definition at, at Nuremberg was circular and its application was highly one-sided. Afterwards, there was this idea, okay, so we move into a new paradigm now where mm, international criminal justice governs all international relations and there are these bold ideas that this is um, a constitutional revolution for the world that is instantiated at Nuremberg in Tokyo, and things will never quite be the same. And then there are processes to say, all right, so let's go about defining exactly what 
uh, the use of force entails, the prohibition on the use of force entails, and by implication what the definition of ag aggression is. And then quickly we get to a point where there are intensely difficult, excuse me, intensely different political appraisals of what should and should not go into that calculus, in large part because states are very differently positioned. Big states with large economic and military power don't have the same vested interests as small countries like Nauru, New Zealand, Australia, and others uh, that have a stronger interest in a rules-based system if it can mean um, an ability to push back against military might uh, in different ways, shapes, and forms. So this, these sorts of differences, countries that are living on, peoples living under colonial rule have a very different set of ideas about when force can and cannot be used, uh, as we see from Justice Powell's dissent a moment ago. And so it's very important for you to understand that all of this long process that uh, the International Law Commission went through to try and define aggression uh, that culminated in a, a, a General Assembly resolution, uh, Resolution 3314, um, over those ensuing years, uh, highly controversial, and there are no applications of aggression over the intervening years. They're highly controversial because states simply don't agree when it comes down, when it boils down to defining things in concrete terms, they find it especially difficult to agree. And so they agree in only abstract and rhetorical ways. You agree at a degree of abstraction that's very Everyone agrees that aggression is a bad thing, but it's only our ability to agree is only made possible by the fact that the norm remains highly abstract. Once we move to start to concretize what it means, what well, does it include humanitarian intervention? Well, that's a very interesting question. Does it include uh, situations where a uh, nation state is unwilling or unable to deal with threats generated by terrorist organizations? Well, that's a very you know, so if the United States intervenes in, say, Syria, to, to take a contemporary example, because Syria is unable to address threats to the United States that emerge from Syria, but that don't belong to the state, is that aggression? All of these sorts of questions are, are very difficult. And uh, part of the reason why there's been no prosecutions of aggression up until this point is uh, the sheer the sheer challenge of creating some type of universal standard that all states might agree to. As we'll see momentarily, we still haven't arrived at that point. This next question starts teasing out one of the poles that I want you to think about conceptually as you appraise the definition of aggression that we will look at in a moment. And that is which entity in the UN Charter has obligations to deal with acts of aggression? How did this entity come about? And both the elements of the question are important for your understanding. The answer to the question is the UN Security Council. And I need to tell you a little bit more about how the UN Security Council came about in order for you to understand its relationship with the use of force ideas that we're discussing. So the UN Security Council and much in the UN Charter is a product of the per perceived failures of the League of Nations. The League of Nations was a, an institution uh, that was widely perceived as instrumental in the uh, lead up to and the catastrophe that was the Second World War. And so in the space after that in the space immediately after the fall of Berlin, there's a desire on the part of states to bring about a different sort of constitutional structure that will have very different results. And one of the key aspects of the failure of the League of Nations 
is perceived to be, it just did nothing. It was completely inept. It, did, it didn't make any concrete decisions. And the reason it didn't make any concrete decisions was there was a rule of unanimity in voting. And so in order to do anything, all states had to agree. And that effectively gave a veto power to all states. And in an instance of, of conflict, of difference of opinion, of uh, rupture in the international community, there would always be a difference of opinion. And so nothing would get done. And sure enough, nothing was done on the part of the institution, which meant it played no role in guaranteeing international peace and security, which led to the, the catastrophe that was the Second World War. So when states are negotiating the UN Charter in 1945, and it's predominantly the Allies, of course, their intuition is, well, we need to do something to correct for that because international law and this whole idea of the League of Nations just made itself completely irrelevant, an important key phrase. Uh, so we have to have an institution that's able to couple international law and governance more closely with power. And so the Security Council is born and the Security Council gives permanent seats to the then most powerful five countries militarily and empowers it to address issues of international peace and security. But it's largely unrepresentative, right? I mean, it's not, it's largely a dictatorship if you want to use inflammatory language. It's the five most powerful military powers who get a very important degree of control over international peace and security through the veto power. The idea being we want this institution to be relevant, to, to say, stay close to power globally, not to just be completely irrelevant and off in the wind doing nothing as politics, economic, military power have, have taken off in a completely different direction, leaving the institution and international law just sort of laughing, uh, not laughing, but power is laughing at international law institutions because there are no implications for it. And so one of the key elements of this process, one of the key aspects of giving to the Security Council some degree of, some important degree of uh, peace and security is to say that the Security Council gets to appraise what constitutes a breach of the peace, of aggression, and of threats to international peace and security. And this is the structure that aggression or the idea of criminalizing aggression immediately pushes up against. This constitutional framework that gave to this particular set of states a largely unaccountable degree of power to regulate. We can discuss in questions whether there is important regulation of the Security Council. It's an interesting and fascinating debate. So this raises the question, well, what is the relationship between the Security Council powers and other areas of international law like international criminal law? And as I mentioned in this instance, there's a fairly direct overlap. And that creates an important degree of tension. The UN Charter has given a, an important degree of political discretion to the Security Council. And yet a whole group of international criminal lawyers will say, oh, well, uh, you know, the Security Council is not at all uh, democratic, right? And um, you know, I'm not kind of sure how effective that has been in um, preventing mass violence like uh, Rwanda, you know, stack, Cambodia, a stack of major genocides over this period, a stack of, of crimes against humanity. Um, the C Security Council during the Cold War pr proved completely unavailable to address its core mandate of ensuring peace and security. So uh, 
we can't we really can't tolerate those sorts of atrocities anymore so we're going to create institutions national and international give them the power over aggression and cut through that security council process that has proved like uh way too deferential to sort of superpower politics the problem with that is that you're immediately up against the UN Charter. And in particular, I wanted to draw your attention to Article 103 of the UN Charter, which, may, which suggests that if there is a conflict legally in terms of treaty provisions between a state's obligations towards the UN Charter or towards the International Criminal Court or towards some treaty that defines international crimes, obligations towards the UN Charter prevail. They are hierarchically superior. And what this means is that not just in terms of power, because obviously the Security Council has far more power than internet, the International Criminal Court or, or any other um, international agency, but also in terms of law, the Security Council's decisions about use of force would triumph over the International Criminal Court's delib deliberations on the issue. So another way of saying that is, listen, go about defining aggression however you want, it's all well and good, but don't cut across the power of the Security Council. You can't do that politically. You don't have sufficient foundation politically to do it, to get away with it. And you can't do it legally either because the UN Charter is hierarchically superior to anything that you could bring about in the ICC. So what you should do to be smart if you're going to define aggression, especially, say, superpowers, is... Um, Find aggression in a way that just it gives continued deference to the power of the Security Council to decide what constitutes an aggression or, and you could think of different ways of doing this, just saying, well, the International Criminal Court could only ever prosecute aggression if the, if the Security Council gave it the green light to do it. Because that's actually the providence of the, the Security Council and uh, for all sorts of reasons, you can't cut across that. You can't be second guessing the Security Council politically or legally. And so that's one of the polls. But already that's a fairly significant affront to the very idea of international criminal justice, which is, well, you know, it's this promise of universal standards that will be part and parcel of a global rule of law uh, that will be enforced impartially and objectively um, and the minute you give the Security Council authorization to sort of control the way prosecutions take place for aggression, well, you, you immediately insulate the P5 countries from ever being prosecuted for it. Formally insulate them. Well, that's a non-starter. And so like the government of India, for instance, very powerful, but not in the Security Council, or the ICC statute for that matter, is arguing very powerfully that you know, any definition of, of aggression that defers to the Security Council is fundamentally unjust because it leaves out superpowers who have no short history of military intervention in violation of the Charter. Also, is the problem by deferring to a political entity for, the, uh, for decisions about who will and won't be prosecuted you're effectively inviting executive influence into what should be an independent judicial process. And again, that's highly inconsistent with uh, ideas about retroactive criminal law and pre-existing defined norms which are enforced in a fair and objective manner as distinct from just sort of like uh, political instrumentalization of individuals after the fact in a highly uh, illiberal process. And then there's the question that we saw in the, in the Glennon reading for today, 
about basic human rights to non-retroactivity and concerns about vagueness. I mean, again, if what constitutes aggression is, is highly vague and really at the discretion of an executive body, one has to wonder whether the crime is adequately defined in order to, main, in order to comply with basic human rights to fair trial. So there are the two poles. Complicated, right? Complicated. How are we going to define aggression in that context? To come back to uh, Schwarzenberger's argument that, well, you know, the truth of the matter is we're really just not, we just really don't have the system of world government that would allow for a functioning criminal justice system to be inserted into the middle of it. Uh, aggression sort of epitomizes those sorts of concerns. And what we're discovering as we go through this discussion about aggression is just how those sorts of concerns play out in the definition now of aggression in the ICC statute. So in a moment, I'm just going to show you my slides about the Kampala Amendment uh, to the ICC statute. What I've done on the slides, which I, I won't go through with you, but I've um, I've referenced different highlighted colors in the PDF that I will show you in just a moment. Uh, and so I'm going to go through the PDF, but not the PowerPoints, but I just thought I would show them to you because I'm going to put everything online and you can look through these just as a reminder of the key attributes that I'll speak to now uh, before we come back to this moment. So... I'm going to switch now to the Rome statute. This is it here. And let me now take you through some of the provisions that govern aggression as inserted in 2010. Now, for context, what you need to understand is that obviously the, the Rome statute that we're about to look through um, existed from 1998 onwards. And so what took place in 2010 in Kampala, Uganda, was a uh, diplomatic conference which created an amendment that states could sign on to, but do not have to. And so it's sort of like an optional protocol uh, which creates a new layer of, of state uh, agreement and ratification. And as we'll see, Presently, there are 30 odd states that have agreed to this. And so what's interesting is that as you read the Rome Statute now, it's not really a, a sort of a universal code that applies uh, across the board to all states parties, let alone all countries in the world. As you know, there's many countries that aren't states party. And nonetheless, as we re read the provisions, we now have to interrogate very carefully whether these provisions apply to all states parties uh, or whether they apply only to a limited set. Uh, in this instance, I'm going to show you provisions of the, the Rome statute uh, that govern aggression that will only apply to a very limited set. And we'll look at the set in just a moment. The definition of aggression itself is contained in Article 8 bis now. And I want to go through with you and, and reference different highlights that I've added to it that will, I think, alert you to uh, aspects of the crime that are, that are relevant and also help you build an understanding of, of quite how this functions and how it positions itself relative to the two poles that I described. So to begin with, I want you to notice in paragraph one, the relationship between the red highlight crime of aggression and the green highlight act of aggression. So paragraph one defines crime of aggression as the planning, preparation, initiation or execution 
of an act of aggression. And then paragraph two defines acts of aggression. So there's this interesting relationship between crime of aggression and act of aggression that you should um, keep in mind. If we look at the yellow in article one, it clearly encompasses a whole range of actions prior to the initiation of an act of aggression, which include planning, preparation, initiation, or execution. There's a really interesting debate to be had um, that I just shared a correspondence with a friend over about whether planning, preparation, initiation are inchoate, meaning it's like an attempt, or there's jurisdiction that arises if those actions take place within a state party that's ratified the amendment, regardless of whether there is execution or not. Um, that's a tricky issue, but I wanted to bracket it for you. The purple in paragraph one is very important for your understanding. And in a way represents a compromise that is deferential to the power concerns that we witnessed just a moment ago when we discussed the different poles that aggression exists within. So the purple says, by a person in a position effectively to exercise control over or to direct the political or military action of a state. And so what this purple language does is that it radically circumscribes the class of individuals that can be held responsible for the crime of aggression. It's not anyone who made a causal contribution to the crime of aggression, uh, which would be the normal sort of standard. It's a, it's a far smaller, narrower group of individuals. And that's important. So there's already been a significant narrowing of who can be responsible for this. For instance, it's not clear that a corporation can be responsible, a business leader or a corporation or um, anyone within a sort of a commercial environment could be responsible for the crime of aggression. And yet after the Second World War, there are a whole series of um, industrialists, a word I don't like because it seems archaic and tends to distance modern business from the reality of uh, atrocity. But there were a number of business people after the Second World War who were tried for aggression because they had gone and, and placed pressure on Hindenburg to have Hitler installed. But IG Farben paid a, a substantial bribe for this purpose. There's a whole set of arguments that Lebensraum was a convenient proxy for corporate expansionism and that much of the aggression was at the behest of, or at least with the compliance of, business. But the purple language does away with this almost immediately. And so what we have here is really a very circumscribed iteration of what took place at Nuremberg. Let's keep going in paragraph one. We get to act of aggression in the initial green that we've seen, and then a reference to character, gravity, and scale constitutes a manifest violation of the Charter of the United Nations. And so firstly, the Charter of the United Nations, which I haven't highlighted, is immediately the crossover between the two poles I described. And yet there's an attempt to sort of control small or negligible violations of the Charter by using language like character, gravity, and scale, which constitutes a manifest violation. Well, I think people say, you know, what constitutes a manifest violation? By adding the word manifest, you don't necessarily do anything to alleviate the indeterminacy of the provision, which we've been struggling with for the last 75 years. Manifest just delays the problem. There's a nice quote in the Glennon piece, which said, you know, this famous American um, comic and baseball player, Yogi Bear, who says, you know, I think what we should do is we should move first base in baseball like a foot or two away from where it is presently, thereby eliminating all close calls at first base. Of course, the point is that 
the close calls are just at a different location now. Um, so each of these terms, character, gravity, scale, manifest, violation, they give to judges a substantial degree of appreciation as to what will constitute aggression. And again, there remains a concern about indeterminacy. Let's come to two and discuss what constitutes an act of aggression. The first thing you need to understand is active aggression is first defined as meaning the use of force by a state against the sovereignty, territorial integrity, or political independence of another state, or in any other manner inconsistent with the Charter of the United Nations. Now, Let's come back to some of our controversies. What about humanitarian intervention? Like if the Security Council doesn't authorize um, military to intervene in Rwanda in 1994, but states nonetheless do it because it's an egregious moral um, obligation and the Genocide Convention creates states, uh, obligations for states to uh, prevent, <clears throat> prevent, underscore, or punish. And so if states had done that, would that be um, fall within the ambit of two? Well, two doesn't really tell us. On its face, it suggests it does. And then the blue parts begin a list, an enumerated list of things that qualify as an act of an aggression. And the first blue part talks about any of the following acts and then got from the General Assembly Resolution 3314 of 1974 that I referenced earlier will qualify as an act of aggression. But then there's an important question. Well, is aggression limited to these sorts of enumerated instances from Resolution 3314? One that's missing from here is cyber attack, which many people say, well, cyber attack now can cause much more human suffering uh, than a number of these different things listed here. So does the ICC have jurisdiction over cyber attack? Well, potentially, it depends on whether you think this list is exhaustive or not. And the text doesn't indicate. It doesn't indicate because states couldn't agree one way or the other. It's highly controversial. I'm not going to go through each of my highlights. Uh, you can look at them one by one in the statute that I'll add to uh, the website. But it's important for you to understand that this initial definition is, in many respects, um, an attempt to circumscribe previous understandings that were applied at Nuremberg. What's also interesting is that there are a number of other places where this process of limiting the scope of aggression plays out in the statute. And I'm going to show you one or two of these now. The first is, and I'm just going to jump ahead, uh, Article 25 of the ICC statute. Uh, this was there previously, and this is all about um, individual criminal responsibility, also known as modes of participation. Uh, modes of participation are a set of legal ideas or legal concepts that tie individuals to atrocity. They're the, the legal tools you look to to say, all right, well, there was this atrocity. Who's responsible for it? And you go to 25 and under A, it says, oh, the person who commits the crime, and then B says the person who orders, solicits, or induces the crime, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's complemented by other provisions that deal with superior responsibility elsewhere. Um, but what gets added to Article 25 as part of the aggression amendments is this 25.3 bis, which says, in respect of the crime of aggression, the provision of this article shall apply only to persons in a position to effectively to exercise control over or direct the political military action of a state. So again, that radically circumscribes the ambit of Article 25 as applied 
In other words, a whole range of different actors can be responsible for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, but only a very circumscribed set can be responsible for aggression. Why? Well, because what was politically achievable in the definition of genocide was very, excuse me, in the definition of aggression was very much at the effect of the same sorts of political influences that we saw in the definition of crimes against humanity, at least initially, and that we saw in the enforcement of international criminal justice throughout. There's another provision that I want to draw your attention to, which is about jurisdiction, which is a further example of exactly what it is that I'm describing to you. And if we look at five, it says, in respect of a state that is not a party to this statute, read the United States, China, India, Pakistan, Russia, the court shall not exercise its jurisdiction over the crime of aggression when committed by that state's nationals or on its territory. So that again is a departure from genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Uh, the basic propositions of jurisdiction, which, which we'll discuss uh, in a, a subsequent lecture, are uh, two. One is uh, a state authority. So if I'm in Australia and um, Australia has signed, the, um, rat signed and ratified the ICC statute, then any international crimes committed by any national, state party or otherwise, in Australia would constitute, would give rise to jurisdiction before the International Criminal Court. So that's one. Territory is the first. The second is nationality. So normally, for all other international crimes, uh, if an Australian commits an international crime anywhere in the world, then that Australian can be held responsible before the International Criminal Court. So territory, nationality are the two. Now, for aggression, though, there's, again, this exception. The exception is the court won't have jurisdiction over the crime against humanity when committed by the state's nationals of a non-state party. So even if Australia is a victim of aggression, uh, the ICC won't have jurisdiction, whereas like, if it's a victim of, of genocide by someone who's not a state a member of a state party, say an American, a Chinese, a Russian, a, um, Indian soldier. Um, so that's anomalous. Let me say that again, differently. If an American, Chinese, Indian, Pakistani, or Russian soldier, i.e. a national of a non-state party, commits a genocide in Australia, then the ICC has jurisdiction. If a soldier from any of those countries commits an aggression in Australia, the ICC does not have jurisdiction. And again, it's out of deference to this particular set of power issues. The last one that I want to show you is Article 121.5. I'm not going to go into great detail into either of these two provisions, the yellow or the green. But I do want to highlight uh, just the green for the moment. In respect of a state party which has not accepted the amendment, well, firstly, let's do both. Any amendment to Articles 5, 6, 7, and 8, remember aggression is 8 bis, of the statute shall enter into force for those state parties which have accepted the amendment one year after the deposit of their instruments of ratification or acceptance. So already it, it suggests that um, there's a reciprocal process. So... In a moment, I'll show you the list of countries that have ratified this. Um, but effectively, what they're offering is, is a system of mutual ability to prosecute um, between them. I'll say what that means in a moment. The Green says, in respect of a state party which has not accepted the amendment, the court shall not exercise its jurisdiction regarding a crime covered by the amendment when committed by that party's nationals or on its territory. The provision has the strange effect where if you say, take two countries, France, which is a signatory to the ICC statute, but has not signed this uh, optional pr protocol on aggression and 
likely will never. Uh, and Australia, um, which let's for argument says, say, say, is a state party and signs the optional protocol. In a moment, we'll see that it hasn't. But if you take countries, one which has signed the, the aggression protocol and one which doesn't, then still neither of them can be convicted of an aggression because in the state, in the case of France, it's not bound by the aggression provision because it simply hasn't um, ratified the protocol. In the, the case of Australia, which for argument's sake has signed the protocol, it can't be held responsible for aggression because its aggression would take place on the territory of a state party that hasn't, i.e. France. And so you get this perverse uh, situation where aggression is even further circumscribed. All of this leads some people to think, ah, oh, this is not going to be prosecuted. This is not going to be prosecuted very often, if at all. In, inter in the International Criminal Court, we should be looking to different avenues. The ability to find someone in that sort of limited um, subclass of, of political military leaders who get to actually make controlling decisions about whether to go to aggressive war in the first place is marginal. Um, the, the ability to do that in circumstances that comply with the jurisdictional, the special jurisdictional limitations that apply for aggression uh, will be limited. And so one wonders whether a lot of what's been defined here is an attempt to insulate the powerful in ways that would allow critiques of international criminal justice to really have a field day. Oh, look, aggression turns out to be emblematic of the way international criminal justice functions as a field. I just wanted to show you this briefly because uh, this is a United Nations treaty collection which contains all uh, treaties and signatories. You start to go down the list and you see already my fictitious example of Australia was exactly that, fictitious, it hasn't uh, accepted. And you start to see the absence of all sorts of different countries that you might hope to be in here, like the United Kingdom and France and uh, many others. So it's a relatively sh small list, 39, and mostly they're countries that don't have enormous military strength. The one notable economic power within this group is Germany. And what an interesting reflect reflection on um, a degree of contrition in Germany that would allow it to take that, that type of stance, a degree of contrition that was in some important degree brought about through criminal justice. So let me come back then to a small set of concluding ideas or questions at least that I, I won't attempt to answer now, but hopefully we can discuss uh, together momentarily. What does the story of aggression tell you about the relationship between international criminal law and power? That is a core question for most of international criminal law. And maybe you can separate out aggression from other aspects of international criminal justice but others would suggest that it's actually a, a powerful metaphor for the shortcomings of international criminal justice broadly. How does this history of this particular crime reflect that of others we have addressed? Think in particular about uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity and the ways in which they're constructed uh, to insulate certain actors from exposure and expose others. How does this leave you thinking about the relationship between moral outrage and political instrumentalization? I set out at the beginning to sort of highlight for you how the history is a tension between those two poles. Um, where does this leave you thinking about both of those ideas uh, in modern international criminal law now? And broadly, is the crime of aggression a glass half full because it's a first step towards a more just world because certain even if we can't catch all aggressors, uh, being able to catch some is, is better than nothing. 
or is it a glass half empty because it's um, you know a vacuous promise that can only operate to the detriment of the weak in the world, um, thereby participating in the sorts of injustices we see rather than alleviating them? I leave you with those questions. I'm looking forward to discussing them with you in just a moment.